From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Pam. Hey, Hilda. So, so good to see you. It's been a long time. I missed the last conference, but I couldn't make it. And I, I know I'm going to see you next year, though. I can't, I'm this year, actually. I can't wait. Me too. I'm looking forward to it as well. Listen, the last time we had you on, we talked about vitamin amazing, which it is. Vitamin A is amazing. And today we want to do a deeper dive in terms of it, how it relates to fertility. So I know you work with a lot of different clients. Talk to us about a patient who has struggled with fertility and some changes they saw through including more vitamin A rich foods in their diet. Okay, so a little bit of background before I tell about a specific, in probably two thirds of the women I see that come in for either trying to get their periods regulated or even a, a percentage of them, like half of them are trying to get pregnant. There are clear signs of vitamin A deficiency you know, it's just so easy to, def it's so easy to see. They have problems with their vision, especially at night. They have bumps on the back of their arms. I see this over and over and over again. So anyway, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but this one patient I'm working with currently, and I could, I could, I'm not as fresh in memory of some of the other ones because I, I, I can think of a couple offhand, but the details, I didn't just review their details and I'd rather have just reviewed a case. And anyway, this, this lady, um, she's 32. Uh -huh. Um, for, for a medical reason on her husband's end, they had to go with the IVF route, which is in vitro fertilization. Mm -hmm. And she had twice already gone through the process where they, um, stimulate the body to produce more eggs with the goal of what they call, um, retrieving the eggs, which they do with, you know, um, a minor surgical procedure. They retrieve the eggs, out of, mature eggs out of the follicles. She had, well, she, the first time she had retrieval, I think she had two eggs. One was usable as far as maturity after, after became fertilized with her, with her husband who had bank sperm. That um, mature egg was then fertilized and they implanted it and didn't implant, transferred, and it did not implant. Okay, so that was the first time. That's the first cycle. The second cycle, she she only got again one mature embryo, and this embryo, and she was very very concerned that the same thing could happen because mm -hmm. if she, and the embryo was a pretty good quality, but it wasn't the top quality. But she was. She was like, well, what if this one embryo, I've got one embryo left, if this doesn't work. So she had talked to her doctor and they decided to do another egg retrieval. She had, in December when she called me, it's funny, I was going on vacation and I, I was like, wait a minute, you know, I actually talked to her on the phone while I was waiting for my husband in a medical appointment. He's fine, but routine, because that's <laughs> the only time I had. And I immediately, because I immediately said to look, you're, you're planning on doing this mid-February, you need to get started right now. We're not going to wait. Because it, Technically, it takes three months to improve egg quality, technically. Mm -hmm. And so I gave her various recommendations after discovering, like, that two-thirds of my, and probably even more, two-thirds of my other patients, she had signs of vitamin A deficiency. I just asked her, I said, do you have bumps on your, oh, yeah. Do, do you have trouble with night vision? Do you, do, what, how do you feel about driving at night? Oh, I never drive at night. They always tell me that. I hate to drive at night. That's a big telltale sign. And I said, you're vitamin A deficient. So with diet and with appropriate supplements, I corrected, I think I corrected the vitamin A deficiency. You, you know, it does take a little time to correct a vitamin A deficiency, but certain tissues in your body respond really quickly, like your eyes. Uh -huh. And using uh, a total in the diet it's hard to know because it depends on the quality of the eggs and dairy she was eating but uh, and she was not going to eat liver she never ate liver um and, she, and it's very hard to get women to eat liver and i have to be super careful too because um i have to know the amounts of vitamin a that people are getting so i don't go over the upper limit of ten thousand total from the diet and so, any sort of nutritional supplement but anyway she did everything i asked she was like gung-ho and that's why I love this field that I'm in because women are gung-ho they want to just do it and, you know it's like what yes and she just had her most recent 
retrieval and um, fertilization. And she got four very high grade embryos. Oh. And the, the, the fertility specialist, the doctor said, this is night and day, the difference. Night and day. Night and day. And she said she was ecstatic. It was like, she said, oh, I cannot believe this is this. You just, you know, she put exclamation points after everything. <laughs> I'm so happy. Oh this my gosh. And, you know, the eggs have not been, the embryos have not been transferred. Um, she now was meeting with me this afternoon again to just refine uh, the recommendations and make sure her body's ready to receive, you know, the, the embryos will implant properly because that's the next stage. You know, I've been really, um, since I've been getting a few more women going through assisted reproductive technology, which really wasn't my focus in the initial stages mm -hmm. of my getting into, into reproductive nutrition, especially for women. It was more like, can I, can I support a woman's pregnancy was really my initial goal. Well, let's back I, up a second. Oh, sorry. Oh, I mean, I, I understand you kind of dove into this area that you weren't planning on going into intentionally, but I wanted to go back to what you said earlier. You said that vitamin A deficiency is very prevalent among women of the reproductive age that you're not surprised you can see the telltale signs. You've mentioned issues with driving at night, issues with vision at night, um, issues with the bumps on the back of the arm, which I remember having back in the day myself. What other things give the indicators or the indicators that were vitamin A deficient? Okay, well, it's really interesting you ask that question because there are probably 20 different indicators. I'm just throwing out a round number there. The classic one are the night, diminished night vision. And the skin problems usually would be, would happen at, at a higher degree of vitamin A deficiency where you might see acne, the bumps, the hyperkeratosis on the back of the arms, Excuse me for one second. I'm just checking something. Um, and um, sometimes eczema, often dry skin, dandruff, all these things kind of can, they don't all have to present together, but they can be combinations of these. Um, a history of acne, severe acne when they were young, especially. Then you've got your eye problems, your inability to see well at night or sensitivity to glare from bright lights at night. Um, on top of that, which is really interesting, and there's not a lot of data on this, but a sensitivity to sunlight is a big one. Oh yeah, and I ask these women, how do you feel about going out in the sunlight? Do you need to wear sunglasses or do you find it difficult? Oh yes, yes, that's, I just always have to wear sunglasses. Oh. I had the same thing. I think if, if any of your listeners had seen my presentation at the Western, Price, the Western Tradition Conference in 2019, I talked about my own personal history of vitamin A deficiency. And I didn't know it until I discovered the Western Price Foundation that that's what I had, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, we all walk around in life thinking we're doing the right thing, yes. but we have the wrong information. And we think, oh, all our friends are struggling with the same thing. I guess it's normal, but it may be common, but that doesn't mean it's normal, right? Exactly. Yes. It's not normal physiology necessarily to have excessive bumps on the back of your arm or to be very uh, sensitive to bright sunlight, all the signs I had, and even dry eyes, if a woman has dry eyes. What's really interesting though, Hilda, because there's some more, there's you know, allergies, there's asthma, there's frequent respiratory infections, there's, oh, I can't even think of them all, but there's a lot. But mm -hmm. the other thing is that it was really interesting, and I've been digging into old research articles, that in the 1920s, when they first started noticing if you made an animal vitamin A deficient, it couldn't reproduce a, a female and a male, but usually it was the females that they were working with. Um, you know, there are a lot of rat studies. There was a researcher and I've got, I'm writing a pretty extensive article for the summer journal. So all this will be detailed in there. So I'm going to just hit on the highlights. But this one researcher noticed that when they changed their animals, the rats diets, the, you know, the experimental rats diets to one that included what he called was inexpensive foods, which was the awful that they collected from slaughterhouses. The, their, their, the numbers of offspring just went up like crazy. Yes, and, I have, <laughs> I have had friends, sorry to interrupt, but I was thinking about a friend of mine who's like, I'm kind of mad at the Western Price Foundation because I keep having babies and <laughs> they were saying it. <laughs> Tongue in so cheek, funny. but this woman had like four kids, which by the way, I did too. And she's like, I can't believe how fertile I am when I eat the nutrient dense diet. And I want to get to that, Pam, but first I want to ask you, and I know you're going to touch on this in the article, but 
why does vitamin A deficiency affect our ability to reproduce or affect our fertility, in other words? Okay, so that's a, that's got about 15 answers to it. <laughs> but I want to finish what I was saying before oh, yeah, yeah, because this researcher said he called it a delicate sign of vitamin A deficiency because in all other aspects, the animals appeared normal. So what, what I took that to mean, and I haven't been able to get the full paper yet, I have to see if I can get it at the university library, is that it's one of the first signs of vitamin A deficiency is the inability to reproduce. And if wow. you think about it, that makes perfect sense. Because why does the body want to reproduce, try to make a new, um, new living, you know, being, in our case, obviously a baby, a human baby, if it can't even take care of itself? Right? Yep. And you asked a very good question, what is actually going on? What is the mechanism of action? Why is vitamin A so important? And I will tell you that in one second, there's like, I'm, this is what I've been working on this morning because I, I keep refining it. I have books and papers and looking back and, in, and there's a lot of stuff in old books that they don't even, it doesn't even get noticed anymore. It's like crazy. It's like lost information. So mm -hmm. you keep having to read what they used to think and see if they followed up on these studies because a lot of this stuff is, gets dropped because there's no money in the research. Mm -hmm. You know, vitamins are not really money, are not money makers for you know, um, corporations or even the government who funds the research, they just, there's nothing to be patented there. There's mm -hmm. especially food. I mean, food, you know, it's like, and of course we all know the story. Nobody wants anybody eating these, these nourishing foods and, you know, nobody in the government does because they think we're all going to, you know, keel over from, you know, coronary heart disease or something. Right. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, we're all running around malnourished unless we've, we've learned better, you know, we've, like I did when I was 40. But anyway, um, I forgot what I was going to say. But anyway, vitamin A is now getting some attention as needed during pregnancy. Oh, good. It's, it's that tide is starting to turn, which is really interesting. I just listened to a podcast by another diet, uh, dietitian. She's been interviewed and she was talking about the need for vitamin A during pregnancy. But the fertility thing. It's just saying, it's just not, there's not a lot of stuff that tells women you can turn your fertility around by, through nutrition. Mm -hmm. And of course, the last vitamin that anybody would ever think of is poor little vitamin A, which actually vitamin A is probably the most important vitamin in our bodies. Wow. You know, and it's like, it's, it's this forgotten, it's this forgotten story that, mm -hmm. you know, but the other part of it is, is that at the same time that we the animal studies are just sort of, you know, forgotten because you know how many studies were done on humans, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can do a study, you can do an observation. And I'll tell you some of the things that they've observed in humans. Um, but um, including when I didn't say, and I'm kind of jumping around here because there's so much information. <laughs> ask me about the signs and symptoms. One of the other signs is no, very little cervical mucus. Oh. And vaginal problems. Uh-huh. And this is something I hear over and over in women. I'm like, and you're only 30? You know, you, you think, you know, yeah. it's going to happen, right? And it's like, it's like they just, they have no clue why this is happening to them. And in the early animal studies, the or one of the earliest signs is what they call cornification of the vaginal tract, vaginal epithelium. And in fact, the same thing happens to the oviducts, which are the fallopian tubes. They became hard and the lack of moisture. That's what cornification is. Basically, the cells become flat, flattened and hardened. That's kind of what the, our skin is. Our skin is keratinized or cornified. And that's mm -hmm. a normal thing, but in our mucus containing tissues, that's abnormal. So that's why we see dry eyes, sometimes dry mouth, and certainly for some women, dry vaginal um, area. And this is a, not a conducive um, environment for the sperm to travel and to flourish. And the sperm have to make it to the fallopian tubes in most cases to actually get together with the egg and create a fertilized um, embryo. It right. It's like it's like it's hitting a pothole <laughs> because it's being impeded. It's it's ability. If there's to nothing to there's these little cilia that are supposed to be in the fallopian yeah. tubes. And I'm sure they s exist to some extent. But just like the lung loses functional cilia when we don't have enough vitamin A. Those cilia are the same morphology, meaning they're the same type of cells that are in the in the fallopian tubes as they are in the lungs. 
And it's recognized that in the lungs, you can get this flattened cilia, reduction of cilia, less mucus, the right kind of mucus, the mucus that actually protects the surfaces and provides in the lungs and in the vaginal tract um, and a sort of a um, antimicrobial action. It's, it's quite crazy. And so I see people, I see women, once they get vitamin A back into their diets, whether it's their diet or a supplement, you know, it depends on the woman, I have to be very flexible, or the right prenatal vitamin, all of a sudden she's getting cervical mucus. All of a sudden she's ovulating. Well, usually the first thing I see is, is, is women saying they feel more energy, by the way. They say, I feel more energy. I'm like, yeah, all right, because it's also needed for your mitochondria. So that's crazy, right? Yeah. Um, and then they say oh yeah, like my eyes aren't dry anymore. And oh yeah, I got a period. And oh yeah, now I can monitor my um, ovulation signs. And I'm seeing these true signs of ovulation or I'm using the, you know, the, the sticks to predict, the urine, urine testing sticks. It's like, I, I mean, it's like crazy. It's like, I call it my secret sauce because wow. it's, I'm, it's not the only thing that I have to tend to, by the way, but it's so prevalent that I, I, it's almost like, how can the medical community be missing this? How can they be so blind that this is happening? I don't, and like you said, I think it's because it's so common to see these signs and, you know, think of the commercials for, well, I don't do so much more for restasis or for the bumps on, you know, the skin bumps, you yeah. know, to see those ads for those products now. And it's almost as if this is normal. And, yep. and vaginal dryness, they've got a solution for that. They've got the um, products that women use, you know, for lubrication. So there's always a product to be sold to correct these things when probably, you know, 50 to more percent of them stem from a vitamin A deficiency, which can also be made work by a zinc deficiency and, or a um, fat deficiency or an iron deficiency. And, you know, when we're talking about women that are doing these healthy, healthy, plant-based diets, that's air quotes. We know that there's not only vitamin A can be a problem, but also zinc and even iron and, and protein intakes. Can you explore that a little bit more? Because I think you're right. I think uh, young women and the childbearing years are often going plant-based. They're influenced by a concern for their environment or maybe their own health. They think this has got to be more healthy. I don't feel energetic. What foods do they turn to and how are those missing this critical vitamin A? Um, well, it's interesting. Now, if you don't eat liver, that right there is going to make me suspicious that you could be vitamin A deficient. And by the way, I didn't forget you wanted to know what happens when you're vitamin A deficient, why you can't be. <laughs> We're going to hit on that. I kind of want to leave that to the end because it is, it is so like really interesting. And I'm only going to be able to touch on like the 15 different things that happen, right? Um, it's it's really that big. It's really that big. So it's crazy. Um, am I being too animated, but no, I mean, no, this I, is great. We're happy. We're happy. People are watching this now. So we want them to be able to see your expressions and your enthusiasm. Because I have just like blown my mind because I knew some before I did this because of I you know, saw it and I needed, I needed to support what I was doing. So I looked up research, but the more I dive into the literature, the more I'm going, where, why are people not seeing this? But anyway, yeah. what's no, so the this problem? Is this is what we want to know. So yeah, we'll talk about at the end um, how exactly this affects our reproductive health. But let's mm -hmm. talk right now about what people are missing in their diet, especially mm -hmm. if they go plant-based. Okay. So number one, if they do not eat liver, I have to right away go and, and what, one out of 50 women that I see have ever eaten liver because it's just not a food they were raised on. And I get it because it's a strong flavor. And it's it's difficult for them to even think of preparing it because the texture is very odd. And then, of course, the other thing, a lot of people are very concerned that liver is toxic and, you know, it's hard to find good quality liver. There's a number of things that work against that. Um, and of course, the other thing is there still is a lot of it messaging on the Internet and other sources that liver is bad for you in general and specifically bad during pregnancy. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it used to be the other way around, by the way. They used to, people used to say eat liver when you're pregnant. Um, wow. That all goes back kind of like to the 90s, especially with the Rothman study. But anyway, yeah, your your listeners can read those details when, when the paper comes out mm -hmm. um, in the Wise Traditions Journal. But um, so, that, okay, so that's number one. A lot of women don't eat eggs or they don't eat high quality eggs, which I think is the most 
biologically available source of real vitamin A in the diet for those who don't eat liver. If you get a really good orange egg yolk, and I know I know the, the foundation, the Weston A. Price Foundation has information on this. I, I haven't talked to Sally about sharing it with me, but I probably will. But how much actually true vitamin A is in the egg yolks of yeah. these pastured animals? And I have a feeling it's pretty significant. Um, so that's number number two is a lot of women are either too busy or they don't understand the importance of eggs or on rare occasion, they don't like eggs. And then even on rare occasions, very rarely I see a woman with an egg allergy. That happens though. So that's the second food I consider fundamental for vitamin A. The third one would be full fat dairy and quality full fat dairy. Again, because of like eggs, the quality of the animal's diet is gonna influence the amount of retinol or vitamin A, true vitamin A in the in the um, product because the, the carotenoids in the grass, in the pasture, convert very well in the animal. They do that really, really, really well to make it to vitamin A into that milk or the egg yolk. Unfortunately, this is, this is part of the whole problem, is we are not as good, most of us are not as good as animals at converting the carotenoids in plants into the true vitamin A or retinol. And yeah. that is even more prevalent in women of European ancestry. And it can be really, really bad. I think I'm one of those really bad people. It can be the, the point that you can only convert like 10% of the carotenoids that you eat to retinol. That's why you, said, you said we want bioavailable sources of vitamin A because sometimes people say, oh, this carrot has vitamin A, but it's actually a precursor to it. So it doesn't Absolutely. really, your body needs the ability to change it into something useful and not everybody can do that well. Yes, and carotenoids serve their own purpose as antioxidants, but, and actually it's interesting, there is some data showing that an excess of beta carotene, and that's the main carotenoid in carrots, and it's difficult to get it just from the diet, but it's not impossible. There are women that I see that eat sweet potatoes all the time. Um, that can interfere with the action of the true vitamin A in the body. Um, there's not a lot of research on that. There's very little, but I did see one or two papers on it. I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Because there was a study years ago that showed, showed that high levels, high doses of beta carotene from supplements were very bad for your body and very specifically for smokers. So, you know, every time we try to think we know better than our ancestors, I think we mess up. <laughs> we really mess up. And that's what nutrition has been doing for the past 50 years, in my opinion. They think they know better than the people that came before us. And so, you know, and then the other part of the equation is that most of the prenatal vitamins that women take do not have any preformed vitamin A in it. They only have beta carotene. Oh, wow. I didn't know that when I was popping those prenatal pills. Yours might have been different. They've changed that a lot since like oh. the 2000 because there's a big scare on vitamin A that came up in the mid 90s and everybody started turning, you know, changing the products and reducing the amount of vitamin A and even taking it out and just using beta carotene. So this whole thing has kind of come together and just created this problem that a, that a few educated and informed people do know but the majority of healthcare um, practitioners and the system in general still tells women to avoid sources of vitamin A during pregnancy. Oh. And so this whole belief that, for, on, on the, and then one other thing, there is this widespread misconception that Westernized populations, you know, more, more uh, industrialized or more modern populations, if you will, don't have a vitamin A problem. Everybody knows, every scientist who, who studies vitamin A knows that, that developing nations have a vitamin A deficiency problem. It's widespread. But it's the United States, Europe, any of these developed countries, more developed countries, nobody thinks it's a problem. And though at the same time, our federal government knows that 80% of women don't consume adequate amount of vitamin A from their diet, even counting sources of beta carotene. So I don't quite get the disconnect. And yes. it's really weird. It's like, what? I'm what's happening? To, it's, it's, well, what's the incentive to make the connection? What's the incentive to correct this? 
in my opinion, fertility specialists have very little incentive to, to fix their patients' nutrition. Well, because their revenue stream depends on people having trouble with their fertility. And what I was going to ask you next was, do you have an idea of what the statistics are of the rate of infertility in developed countries? I feel like it's on the rise just anecdotally from talking to my young friends who are of that age who are like, you know, we're hoping to have kids, but we don't know. Yeah, um, I'm going to have to go back to my paper, but the rates right now are between 8 and 12% in couples. And I think I can tell you what the increase has been. I think it's increased by, oh, I, I just remember that number, but it was like 1% a year for, for it's it's a um my paper but these numbers sometimes escape me when you ask me no sure the top of, i understand there's a resource you have to look at you but know, in the meantime since you were talking about couples it occurred to me it i wanted to ask you the question out. about men do you um now i know you work primarily with women but i suspect that men also have low levels of vitamin a and that's also causing kind of a a compounded issue when you go to about wanting to have kids. Oh yes, oh yes, and then and I can explain why the sperm is affected by the vitamin A as well, as well as the as the woman's reproductive ability. So um, you know it's more pervasive in a woman, obviously because there's more things that happen in the woman, but the creation of sperm requires vitamin A. And if you and it also the same thing I t uh, mentioned before, where you get that um, keratinized tissue, that happens to men too, and their sperm, their sperm, um, I can't even think of the name of the spermaduct or whatever it's called, also gets keratinized. Uh -huh. But in animal studies, the count, the morphology, the um, what's the count morphology, motility of sperm can be affected by vitamin A deficiency. And you know what's really interesting? I don't think people. This is another area which I think people don't understand is I believe that these highly damaged oxidized industrial seed oils that are pervasive in our food environment, especially in fried foods, and men eat a lot of fried foods, we know that these deplete vitamin A because they create excessive reactive oxygen species and vitamin A is needed along with some other things to quelch I'm sorry, quench by uh, reactive oxygen species. And right there, that's a cause for infertility in both men and women, this excess of react reactive oxygen species, because there's there's a delicate balance between antioxidants and oxidation during the um, reproductive processes. And when that gets tilted too much to oxidation, you get damage of sperm, you get damage of DNA. And vitamin A is so important in that whole process. So there's 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 some definite things that we know, and then there's things we can probably surmise are going on mm -hmm. because you can look at the connections. So what I'm going to do, and if you want to ask me another question, I'm going to go to look at that list so I make sure I get this all right. I know. Yes. Some people can recite these off the top of. <laughs> like, can that be true? Can that be true? I mean, it's like crazy. Can you imagine? But did you have uh, another question before I start talking about how it actually? Um, what happens in, in um, men and women, starting with women. Right. No, that's awesome. Well, I guess I am grateful. I will just say that you mentioned at least three vitamin A rich foods, the liver, the uh, dairy products and eggs. Um, actually, it was liver. Eggs, commonly eaten. Products. Commonly right. eaten. You commonly can, eaten. I've heard, I don't know what the levels are in things like shellfish. Uh -huh. I imagine fish eggs are very good. Um what else could be a really good source? Um, anything an animal product, a young growing animal or an organ meat would have more because, well, first of all, vitamin A in the body is stored generally, they think about 90% of the vitamin A in the body is stored in the liver. And that could be another problem as well because if people don't have healthy livers, they either don't store enough or they can't release it. Mm. So I have this theory, <laughs> a lot of women with PCOS get pregnant when they, this is a theory, I have a lot of theories because I see these associations yeah. get pregnant when they start to lose weight. Now there could be lots of reasons for that, but one of the reasons could be is their livers, livers get healthy. They, they reduce the fat in their liver. Now their liver's functioning and exporting vitamin A out of it. Or two, the adipose tissue can contain up to 20% of the body's stores. Ah. So as they lose weight, they can release that vitamin A into their bloodstream if they've stored it there. Oh, that's interesting. It's a good possibility. It's not, it's not a bad theory. It, it's a theory, you know, yeah. but, but when I see a woman that's told me she, 
you know, she says, oh, I've got PCOS. I've been diagnosed with PCOS. And I'm like, well, let's see if you really have PCOS. I don't say that to her. I think it in my mind because I would say 30 to 50% of women I see don't even have PCOS. Wow. They have nutrition problems, which PCOS is polycystic ovary syndrome, considered one of the major causes of infertility or subfertility in women. And it gets diagnosed so easily. Women are not cycling regularly or they have um, cysts in their ovary. Two of those things can be just caused by nutritional problems. Mm -hmm. Those two can be results of nutritional problems. And again, I don't want to just say vitamin A because it's not just vitamin A. There's a number of things. I but understand. The, be, I'll touch on that in my paper. And the third thing is the excessive amount of testosterone, which I don't know. I have a feeling that's an in utero exposure in a lot of, in a lot of women that this happened in utero and, mm -hmm. and or it's from excessive stress and or the obesity can cause it too. So, um, but in a woman that's not overweight, significantly overweight, and they tell me they have PCOS and they don't have any problems with hair growth on their face, I'm like, no, I don't know about that. You know, I tell them, I say, look, you know, you might have PCOS, but that's not my assumption. I'm going to look for everything else that could be wrong nutritionally or lifestyle. Mostly it's nutritional. Sometimes it's stress, right? Yes. I, and that, that could cause these symptoms. And we're going to clear those up because if I assume that you have PCOS and go down that trail, I may be missing things. I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting to consider everything. And then the second aspect of that is there's a lot of dietitians and nutritionists and alternative practitioners that are now doing what I do. You've probably seen it. Oh yeah. Do yeah. I'm so grateful. I cannot tell you that they do it the same. I mean, if no. you're Weston a price trained foundation trained, yes, probably. But, but with the... not... go ahead. No, I was just gonna say the beautiful thing is they are not accepting a label or diagnosis as a kind of stamp of this is the patient's destiny, but rather they're working with the individual, uh, whether or not they're, you know, Weston A. Price trained, I think they're looking for other ways in which to shore up their overall health. And as their overall health improves through diet, movement, all the things, mm -hmm. uh, they're probably their chances of having a baby increase. Yeah. And those are the root causes they're looking for, right? They're looking for the root causes, which is really interesting because I've worked with some um, an alternative sort of OBGYN group, and they they identified root causes as thyroid function, progesterone deficiency. Um, some cases DHEA was low. Sometimes other things like they have a bunch of tests they run, and they consider those root causes. It's called um, the methodology is called restorative reproductive nutrition, but I don't consider those root causes in many cases. Those are not root causes. Why does someone have low progesterone? You know, why is their thyroid not functioning well? So you can get to levels of root causes. And I'm not saying I can fix everyone's thyroid problems. That, that, that could be also related to environmental toxins and stress and stuff like that. But never stop until you get looked down and say what, you know, it's almost like, okay, you, you need to know the biochemistry. But more than that, you just need to know where they're getting their nutrients from. And what signs and symptoms of nutrient shortfalls do they have? They're not, the, and they're not that hard to find if you know what you're looking for. You just look at their diets and you can start making some assumptions. And in some cases, I will ask for levels, zinc levels, iron levels, vitamin D I will ask for because I want to make sure it's not too high or too low because both of those to me are a problem. Um, but vitamin A is tough because it's not, the blood levels don't reflect the body levels. So you can't really use that necessarily reliably. I see. Yeah. But let's I mean, go ahead. Can. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, let's go ahead and um, get to those 15 issues that the woman's body can have because of a vitamin A deficiency, and then maybe those of the men. And then I have one more question before we wrap up. Okay, great. So vitamin A deficiency affects reproduction at almost every stage, right from the preconception to, you know, to the of pregnant. Let's see. So I'm going to speak more about the things that happen early on. Well, in pre in the preconception time, well, you know, this is really interesting. In the pre 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 conception time, he's going to laugh when I say this, but <laughs> women's eggs mature um, go through the first stage of meiosis in while the the, the the baby, the female baby, is in utero. Amazing. So in other words, vitamin A, a young vitamin A is needed for that vitamin A stores are affected by how her mother and maybe even her grandmother ate. 
or lived? Her grandmother, yeah. Well, okay, so for example, my daughter's eggs were created when I was pregnant. Wow. And they go through the first stage of what they call meiosis, which is a, it's an important part of cell division and maturation. And that happens in utero at around 12 weeks. And it's part, it is partially dependent on adequate vitamin A. That's amazing. Now, I don't know if that's affected because I think if your vitamin A levels were so low, the, the, you'd have a miscarriage. The, the mother would have a miscarriage. So I don't know, but they see this in animals. And, but they do know that there's a reduced number of eggs in the animals that have where they're the mother of the animal had low vitamin A levels. So that could reduce the number of eggs and it could reduce the stage of the, the number that ever make it to that first stage that has to happen in utero. So that's one. Okay. That is again, a little bit of theory, but you know, it's, it's could explain why some women I try to help. I can't even help because maybe that just stuff has been going on too long and too early to even change. Uh, or I haven't found the reason. Um, okay. The next thing that happens is there's an interruption with the creation of the um, sex hormones. There's not enough test, uh, estrogen made necessarily. There's not enough progesterone made. Also, thyroid hormone can be affected because it works together in the cell. Basically, vitamin A is, a, is really considered a hormone. Mm. And thyroid hormone and vitamin A work together. And so do all these steroid hormones work together with vitamin A in the cells. So vitamin A actually has a regulatory function on the body as far as it works in the, its genetic effects. Because there's some other effects of vitamin A, like antioxidant, a couple other things. But in the nucleus of the cell, it actually controls how, how cells actually express their DNA. So it turns on certain genes and turns off certain genes to regulate things. And that's, that's why it's very important in early development, early, um, right up to as soon as conception occurs. But before conception, it's important for the hormones. And um, the other thing is, I'm going to go back to the paper because I want to make sure I get these in order. Um, let's see the next one. Oh, this is interesting. I just read that this morning. It seems to be required, required for the selection of the dominant follicle. That is the follicle that releases the mature egg at ovulation. And you know how many women I see that do not create dominant follicles? And what does that mean? That means they have cysts. If you don't have dominant follicles, you have multiple cysts. And what is that thought to be? Polycystic ovary syndrome. Whoa. <laughs> so correcting, correcting the diet could help prevent some of these situations you're describing. Oh, oh I, I, I see it all the time. Wow. I see it in at least two thirds of the women I see. I see. Okay. I, I'm seeing, I'm starting to connect have, the dots. Yeah. yeah. I have not actually done a review of all the cases. I'm starting to go back and look as I write this article, but you know, I'm, I'm half retired. So I, I do other things for fun. And so it's like, I, I really love helping women, but sometimes I'm like, Oh boy, if I look at another paper today or something, I'm going to blow up. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Because I'm trying, there's so much data that I'm looking at, um, but nobody's really doing these studies. Um, but I do have one study in the end I'm going to tell you about. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. We talked about the meiosis in utero. We talked about having the appropriate cervical. Okay. We talked already about the cervical mucus, the healthy vaginal tract, even the uterine tissues to put, depend on vitamin A and the, certainly the fallopian tubes do as well. So you, any of those things and all of those things right there, if you don't have healthy tissues that usher the eggs and sperm together or allow the egg to implant, um, you know, that's right there, fertility problems. So you may be ovulating again. If, if you didn't have, if you have really low vitamin do, because it's all very genetic as by the way, um, and that, that we've talked about before, um, not all of it, but 50% of women have inability or 50% of people have an inability to make enough vitamin A really from just the carotenoids. But the, the degree of vitamin A, for some reason, a vitamin A deficiency doesn't look the same in everybody, even if all things were equal. I think they, well, they only know this probably from animal studies because what they've seen in, in animals that given the same diet, which was vitamin A deficient, deficient diet, there was a range of outcomes that they saw. Some were actually able to have um, litters mm -hmm. that survived term and then they just didn't have fully developed eyes so that was the best outcome 
the worst outcome, if you, you know, I don't know if it's worse for the animals, but it's, you know, the worst if it was a human, they couldn't even get uh, their estrus, which is basically a monthly, not a monthly cycle, but a cycle like ours, right? Like women's. Mm-hmm. And then in between, some would get pregnant, but then had a um, resorption of the fetus, which is basically similar to an early miscarriage, let's say. So all the animals were given the same vitamin A deficient diet for the same amount of time, which was like five months before they were um, bred and then a month after that they were bred. And so they didn't lose if they got pregnant, they didn't lose the fetus because they finally put the vitamin A in. Right. Because if you didn't have any vitamin A for the whole pregnancy, there would be no way that that pregnancy could go to term. But some reason, some of these animals, whether they saved enough from their previous diet or just was able to mobilize it better. Some of them didn't have the, the outcomes that others did. Some much, much, I don't know, they're all bad outcomes. I mean, humans don't want and, uh, babies that have full eye development. Um, I have a yeah. feeling that with humans, we have, um, that, that does happen. Um, there are some birth defects that we suspect, people suspect, They just uh, and, and um, at fertilization and fertilization at one of those stages. So, you know, it's, it's hard to know which in some cases, um, but a lot of women I see do start to ovulate regularly when they have vitamin A and they've been, you know, they haven't ovulated in a year. So it's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so also if you don't have enough progesterone and that's another thing vitamin A is needed to create. You cannot, um, you cannot maintain your pregnancy. So that's another one. And um, that's thought to be partly from a reduced conversion of that very important molecule cholesterol to pregnenolone, which is the next step in the synthesis of steroids. And that, as we know, cholesterol is is one of our friends when we want to reproduce. Um, So it's important to have the egg is a great vehicle for both cholesterol and vitamin A. So that's why I always tell women, hey, you know, what is an egg? (laughs) You want to get fertile? You know, eat something that, you know, has ability to, you know, be That's fertile. Right. Probably not. The egg, yeah, the like, fish row, all these things are are yeah. kind of precursors, precursors and symbols of what we should be ingesting. And I'm glad you mentioned that bit, Pam, about how some of the animals still were able to hold on to their pregnancy or seem to still, you know, have babies or litters that looked healthy because of their own um, previous, you know, inputs from their own. Whatever the differences were, parents. I don't think the researchers uh, that I I read this just briefly, the synopsis of the study in a book, and I'm like, wow, that's really interesting that they all were treated the same. Yep. And yet Things some of them had different. entirely different outcomes. Yeah, it comes to my mind because I live in the city and I see some folks of a lower economic class and somehow they're fertile like crazy. And I'm like, I know they don't have the best diet, but maybe (laughs) maybe their parents or grandparents had a more solid base of real food. Um, I don't really know everybody's history and some of the immigrants too, right? Like they might have a better base and that's why they were able to carry the term and and see kids. We don't know. Maybe they were eating eating a lot of eggs because eggs used to be pretty cheap, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. um, also, fortified cereals in some cases, they used to fortify cereals with a lot of vitamin A. They've taken that out. So, but uh-huh. I also want to mention African American people of color in general, much less likely to have difficulty converting beta carotene to vitamin Ooh, A. Very interesting. Huh. Yeah. Okay. And did you touch on the, um, how the vitamin A deficiency affects men? Were you going to touch on that as well? I haven't finished women yet, though. Oh, okay. okay? couple more things. Um, I just have to find this. Okay. It can contribute to um, lack of vitamin A can cause chromosomal defects. So that can cause a miscarriage, especially an early miscarriage. Mm. Okay. Um, Oh, and by the way, when they gave low income women, speaking on what you were talking about, vitamin A supplementations, there was an increase in the amount of progesterone that was produced by their placenta. So there is a direct I'm not saying that has anything to do with what you just said, but there is this thing where you need vitamin A to make progesterone. Um, let's see. Oh, oh, I forgot to mention this, but it's an antioxidant for both eggs. So we talked about that before, and it actually can quench the um, the of oxygen species. And finally, and this is this is the most 
acknowledged role of vitamin A during pregnancy. It's needed for the differentiation of as this, as the embryo goes, you know, through growth and into the fetus. All the different cell types have to be created from stem cells, and you cannot do that without vitamin A, or it's not done properly. And that's why we can see birth defects like heart problems, and in fact, a very common one now is called diaphragmatic. Oh, I forgot now what it was. Oh, it's a um. It'll come to me in a second. I just learned about it today. Diaphragmatic, uh, da, 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 what is that? Hernia that mm. you can have. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia, which has gone up in, in um, incidence since the uh, 1990s and um, kind of interesting because that yeah. could relate to vitamin A deficiency, heart problems. Um, oh, and finally, when I, I, oh, mitochondrial energy. Vitamin A is needed for mitochondrial energy, and that's needed for both egg and sperm quality and function. So I'm kind of touching on the male role here. And then finally, I want to talk about the IVF role. Um, they, they, I mean, obviously, all most of these processes should be occurring during IVF, except for, let's say, the fallopian tubes, IVF in, in vitro fertilization, where they implant the, the um, eight cell blastocyst, I think it's eight cells, into the woman's uterus. And, and it, you know, that's where the conception basically starts in, well, that's where it's transferred into the uterus. Mm-hmm. There's been some studies, and, and I am um, particularly going to mention one where they looked at the levels of fat soluble vitamin and fo- it, vitamins in follicular fluid. That's the fluid that surrounds the eggs, that's within the follicles that hold the egg. Mm-hmm. What they found is the vitamin A, D, and, and E con- um, contents of the follicular fluid very much match the levels of the serum. But what was even more important and really interesting is that vitamin A levels, and also to, to some extent vitamin E levels, actually predicted the fertilization success each each individual egg in the IVF process. Wow. So the higher vitamin A in the follicular fluid, the more likely the eggs were to be fertilized and go through that process. And embryo scores were better with a higher, um, they do these scoring systems. I have to research that and figure out exactly how they do this, but there's like all these number and letters and there's high scoring ones and lower scoring ones, but they were better with the vitamin A. And in fact, there was a negative association between higher vitamin D levels in the blood and the day five embryo scores. And with vitamin D, there was no correlation with fertilization success. Now, what I take that to mean is, Uh and I'm not really sure because there's other researchers have found that vitamin D is helpful, and I think it is helpful. But what you are seeing now is women being prescribed two to five thousand IUs of vitamin D. All everyone seems to be getting their vitamin D levels test, and I'm not against that. I think it's good to get it tested. Is it totally reflective of what's going on in the body? No, not really. But if you know it's in the 20s, that's not good. If you start seeing it much above 50, you start saying, well, you really don't need to be taking that level for that long. I mean, I've had women come into me with 5,000 IU vitamin D for like years. Mm. I'm like, why are you taking that? Oh, my doctor said to take it. I'm like, you just can't take that indefinitely. Yeah. And we know from what uh, Dr. Chris Masterjohn has written that that actually uses up vitamin A in the body. Mm -hmm. And so vitamin A and vitamin D have to be partnered. And if you wanted to do the, you know, the old fashioned way, the cod liver oil is a great match. I don't think cod liver oil has enough vitamin D for the winter. But if you did in the summer and the spring and the fall, if you have an access to sun, that's really, if you want to do it that way, that's the best way to get your vitamin D. And the other thing is, I think, at least this is what I've heard from the foundation testing of different foods, lard is a pretty good source of vitamin D and so is so are egg yolks. That's right. That's absolutely right. Wild fish and fish eggs. So for those of your listeners who don't want to do any supplements other than food-based supplements, those are alternatives. But I would encourage some sun exposure as well to keep those vitamin D levels up. Very Thank much. You. I love what? it. Thank it you. makes and me I- so happy that God. some of these most effective foods as vehicles of vitamin A are also so delicious. So I'm just chiming in on that bit. Um, Excellent. Oh, and that's really funny because I, it's funny, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in a retirement community, mostly because I like to play tennis and other sports with people. I enjoy. And, um, 
And my husband and I, we just have more energy. I mean, I'm, I'm bragging, but we have more energy and we stay healthier than almost anybody we know. Wow. And honestly, I have to attribute most of that to vitamin A. I really, it's crazy. It's crazy yeah. because I was not like this when I was younger. Before wow. my Price Foundation came into my life, basically. So mm-hmm. I just, I, I think it's great for all ages, but the, the need for it during um, pregnancy and pre-pregnancy, it's not only so a woman and a man can have a baby, it's so that the baby is healthy. And, and, you know, that's a whole nother story about why it's so important for the baby, but, totally. you know, at every stage of life, and including during lactation, but um, it's really, it's ir- couples to reproduce using all these high tech methods. Yes. Without thinking, oh, you're going to agree. What are you going to say, Hilda? <laughs> No, I, 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 I'm, I'm no, totally finish your sentence. I happen to be scratching no, my head, but I, I agree a hundred percent. What you were thinking, because I can think, I think we were on the same wavelength there. I want you to finish it for me so I can hear it from somebody else. Well, it's just I was thinking about principle number eleven of the Wise Traditions Dietary Principles. It's that couples would prepare for pregnancy beforehand, like they were eating their most nutrient dense diet. They were getting that sunshine. They were outside, so they weren't just doing it when they wanted to conceive, they were doing it ahead of time so that their bodies were most optimally ready to bear children. And then, like you said, to give them the great head starts, they were really preparing for future generations even before they came together, if that makes sense. And they did not have an alternative in those days. No, (laughs) that's right. We have decided that we have alternatives to nature. And Okay, sometimes it's needed. I do see women like the, the woman I told you about at the beginning of the um, podcast that I think, you know, she she needs to use that procedure. She cannot get around that. But she still wanted, but unfortunately she had to go through a couple bad experiences to realize, you know, maybe I need to prepare. And I think she was so motivated by those bad experiences, but what we don't want there's a lot of women that are having, I'd say, mediocre experiences mm. that could have much better experiences. And the mediocre is a weird word, but but it's like that's one of the regrets I had because I felt I could have done better. Now, mm-hmm. thank God all my children, our children are healthy and then my daughters have been able to have children. And, you know, but when you look back and you realize that this information wasn't available to you you become a warrior for others, right? And that's what yes. you are. A warrior totally, for totally. You know, and I'm thinking of the phrase that um, is attributed to Dr. Price, life in all its fullness is mother nature obeyed. Life in all its fullness is mother nature obeyed. What does that mean? It means living according to these natural principles. It flows also. You don't need to go through all these kind of backbend experiences that embrace modern technology that forget the past because the past has clues for us. And some people call what we're doing now, Pam, as part of the remembering. It's kind of drawing us back to principles that were the bedrock of healthy living in the past. And for centuries, millennia. Mm -hmm. And so we decide now that we could, you know, when we started with the first test tube baby in the 1970s, this was, you know, science I don't want to say it's run amok, but, you know, they start with this experiment and now it's become this, what they call it, I, they term it the reproscape. It's this huge industry mm. and it does not care where the couple is, or is starting off from. And I would say, you know, there probably are situations that happen in utero in early life that may prevent a woman from normally reproducing or a man. And I get it. And because, you know, there's things about me that I'd be like, oh, I bet that would be different. You know, I bet I wouldn't have to wear glasses for distance vision Mm -hmm. if I had enough vitamin A in your utero. And when I was young, because I actually have those genetics that that I need real vitamin A. So I always wonder, do I... Could I have been better? Could I have been different? Now, with that said, do I blame anybody? Well, if anybody is to blame, it's just really modern medicine. It's not my parents because I was lucky I ate liver when I was growing up. I don't think my mother ate liver when I was pregnant, when she was pregnant with me. But um, I just think that 
we went as we as women and men can't blame ourselves if we didn't do everything right because it's hard to find this information i know it's getting easier all the time but the internet and all the media and all the social media is cluttered with stuff and to get this stuff to stand out is getting in my opinion harder because of the forces outside of us pushing this plant-based diet agenda and also the money to be made in the modern medical system with this reproductive technology and um i don't get referrals from reproductive specialists i don't get them wow although yeah, this doctor i'm thinking of reaching out to her because she her patient the one that i, I told you about at the beginning yes. asked what can i do maybe you can do something with nutrition you know she gave her a list of a couple supplements um and coq10 was one of the things she was taking uh -huh. um but i i just felt she was like, well, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. And so anyway, you want to know about what how it affects men. Yes. And the male reproductive system. And, and I said, as I said before, they get the um, um, things in the um, in the um, reproductive track. It's the epididymis, the prostate and the seminal vesicles. They can be, become keratinized. So again, that's going to be hard for them to pr produce the right um, the type and a number of sperm because everything that happens in the body um, metabolically, biochemistry happens in a fluid solution, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing really happens to any great extent. In fact, a keratinized cell is a dead cell. We know that the, the skin on the surface is our body is basically dead cells. Mm -hmm. There's no biochemistry going on here. It doesn't happen until underneath where there's moisture. And that's what we need. We need we need a fluid medium mm -hmm. to do everything biochemically in our body. So when they so if you think of that in and of itself, that's enough. That's enough right there. Mm -hmm. Stop everything. Mm -hmm. You know? So I mean they don't put the egg and the sperm together in a uh in a dry jar and they put it in a petri dish with a medium. Right. And that's what we need to we need to make sure our medium and our body is full of the nutrients that we need and we have plenty of it. Mm -hmm. And then also with the men, there could be problems with the DNA. And that is going to um a, an embryo um what's the word for it? There's a there's a word. I'm looking for it, but it's basically an early miscarriage. Uh, yeah, it just it has too many genetic defects to survive. Right, right. Yeah, a spontaneous abortion. I guess they sometimes call it that kind of thing, right? Like, yeah, they call it. It's medically, it's called a spontaneous abortion. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I I never use that word with women. I use a miscarriage. But right. um, but everybody thinks those things are so common now. They say fifty percent of pregnancies end in spontaneous abortion. Um. I know. <laughs> so well, a lot of times people, women don't know they're having them. Well, right. but sometimes they're so early women don't know. I see. I see. And there's there's this thing called a chemical pregnancy, which is probably a very early spontaneous abortion where there's the the HCG goes up and up and then all of a sudden it drops. But there's really no there's no fetal. You know, there's nothing you can see in the uterus. It's probably just absorbed, reabsorbed. Right. Well, Pam, I feel like you've given us so much information. It's amazing. And speaking of amazing, I will put a link in the show description so people can find our previous conversation so they can even find more sources of vitamin A to rectify vitamin A deficiency for fertility and for just a healthier, more energetic life, whether it's a man listening or a woman. But I also wanted to just wrap up now with the mm -hmm. question I like to pose at the end, if the listener could do one thing to improve their health that might be related to fertility. It might not, it might be related to vitamin A, it might not, but if they could just do one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? Well, as a dietitian and a Weston A. Price member for many, many years, there's so many things, but I would have to say, eat liver. <laughs> I love liver. it. <laughs> yes, and there are ways to go about it, so it's not, unpalatable yeah. you know you yeah, look up the day. liver files the liver yes. files on the western price website and there's other resources but that i mean certainly there's a million things that contribute to our overall well-being but that is what i would have to leave your listeners with because that is 
that is a turnkey, in my opinion, to much better health if you're not already doing so. Well, that is fantastic. Thank you, Pam, so much for this conversation. It has been a delight. Oh, Mike, me too. Anytime, Hilda. And listen, I look forward to seeing you in, in November and everyone else. And I'm supposed to be giving a talk on this and Great. look out for my article. I think it's going to be in the summer issue. And um, I always look forward to lots of interaction with people because I learn more when people ask me questions and tell me things that they've experienced. Thank you.